Uh, so I'm Nicolas Frankel. I've been a developer for a long time, and now I'm a developer advocate. Um, when I started my career, uh, we didn't talk about observability, we talked about monitoring. And monitoring at that time, and you see I have gray hair, uh, were a bunch of people sitting and lo looking at a big screen, or multiple small screens, uh, each of them displaying a dashboard. And when something happened, something strange, something not usual, then they would do their, their stuff. Um, but unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, um, the system became more and more distributed. Um, in, the, in this talk, I will use the word distributed system in, instead of the M word, which I believe is very tainted, the M word being microservices. So if at any time I say microservice, just like slap me because it's, it, I shouldn't say it. And so with distributed services, we, we couldn't just like watch screen and try to infer what happened. So we came with the word observability. And this is a, a Wikipedia description because I'm super lazy and it's not a bad description. Um, but actually it mentions logging and tracing, but there is the old one, which are metrics. So the three pillars of observability are metrics, logging and tracing. In this talk, I will mostly talk about tracing, but I will still metrics and logging, especially logging. So metrics, we have done that for ages. I believe it's a solved problem. My only advice for you would be just stop looking at CPU and memory and whatever, and just, if you could just like get metrics that are closer to the business, because the business doesn't care that much about the memory usage, but they care a lot about, I don't know if you are an e-commerce, the number of uh, requests per second, the, the number of orders per second, this kind of stuff. Logging is not that easy, I'm afraid. So when I was younger, so I was a Java developer. Um, who here is a Java developer? Uh, most people, okay. More than half the room. Um, I thought, oh, logging is super boring. Uh, it's very hard to do. I will create a Java agent that will log all input parameters and we look, log all uh, outputs. So Java agent means you write it once and now you can use the agent across all your application. And I thought I was very smart um, until I realized that I was actually logging the passwords of some people because some methods add the password as an input parameter. So the conclusion is Yes, it's boring, yes, it's hard, but you need to do manual logging anyway, and you need to put as much effort in reviewing the logs of your application as reviewing the code of your application. Logging code is code, and the log that are not well designed, you will miss them when the, something bad happens. Another lesson is uh, the logging formats. We have been taught very early on that the logs should be human readable, but nowadays, actually, the logs, they are sent to a centralized logging system. And when there is a problem, you don't log in to the machine. You don't try to read the log on the machine. You go to, to the centralized logging system. Worse, the machine might not even exist anymore because it was a container. So if you write human readable logs, you will need to process them uh, through, I don't know, ngrok or whatever, and pour them into JSON to send them to the, to the system. So why don't you write directly JSON? It will remove one component, it will ease your workflow, and nowadays I believe every library in every stack is able to output JSON. Again, when I started uh, to work, I was told you should never ever write on the STD out or STD RRR. You should always write to logs. I know that most of us are using containers. Where do we write our errors? Yes, on the log. So it changes all the time. 
Other issues, you need to think whether you will actually push the log or scrape the log from the system. I already mentioned the structure versus instructor. You need to think how long you will need to store the log, how much it will cost, uh, and how to search the log, because if you have the logs but they are not uh, readable, it's not super useful, and how to display them. Um, so here are a couple of uh, like logging uh, components. I'm most familiar with Elastic, but I think any of them works very nice. Now comes the real meat, the tracing. And that's something most of us are not used to. And the ID, so here is the Wikipedia definition, but I don't like it. The ID is you have a, um, a business transaction that goes through a distributed system across several components, and you want to follow it across all those components. Pioneers in this area were Zipkin, Jaeger, and Open Tracing, and they are still there today, but Open Tracing, I will get back to it later. The problem is there were proprietary tools. So if you bet on one of them, you actually limit the number of components or frameworks or libraries that you can use to the ones that are compatible. So when such thing happen, what we need is a standard. And for that, we have the W3C trace context specification, because it's a strong governing body. You don't want to have the XKCD comic where, hey, we are 14 competing standards, we will create one like that rule over them, and now we have 15 standards. We want a real standard. And yeah, W3C, as I mentioned, is strong enough to do that. The ID, who, who read the spec, by the way? Oh, OK. It's very, very short. Um, it, it's not that hard to read. And the ID, it describes two things. It describes a trace, which actually is a business transaction across several components. And it describes a span. A span is part of the a trace, and it's something that happens inside of the component there should be at least one span in a component. There can be multiple ones. There can be internal spans. And spans are bound in a parent-child relationship. So it's big words to see this simple stuff. Here, you have a trace that goes across several components. Three components is x, y, and z. And the first here the span happen in X, and then it gives two spans in the two other components. And you can see that uh, the, the, the spans in Y and Z are probably parallel. Yeah, it's a, just a diagram. OK, that, that seems to be easy enough, right? We just define how to pass the trace ID, how to pass the parent span ID, create a new span, and everything works. But we are lazy. We are developers. So we want the tools to do that for us. And the tool is OpenTelemetry. OpenTelemetry is the tool that part, um, implements uh, the uh, specification, but also give you the tool, the SDKs, and everything around to do that easily. Um, it's a merge of open tracing that I mentioned before and open census. So it's one of the few uh, good and successful open source mergers in history. Uh, it's part of the CNCF today. It's licensed with Apache V2 and it has many, many followers. And I said uh, yesterday that actually I feel that open telemetry is a black hole, that it attracts a lot and lot of like actors in the industry. And nowadays everybody is using to open tele not is using, is implementing open telemetry. That seems super similar to the diagram you had. Um, uh, actually, open telemetry uh, defines two important stuff. It defines how to communicate. So it defines uh, the protocol and the formats to send open telemetry data. What it doesn't define is how you collect and how you store the data. Though it provides something called the open telemetry collectors, it's just for you to use, it's just a utility, 
but it's not prescriptive. In that regard, uh, you can use Jaeger and Zipkin nowadays who are open telemetry compatible to be open telemetry collectors. So you can send open, tele open telemetry data to any of them and they will be happy to continue functioning. The good thing is that first you can continue to use your um, open telemetry, uh, sorry, your uh, tracing uh, components without any change. Just say, okay, I will open a new port which accepts open telemetry data. And second, if at some point, once you start using open telemetry, you are not happy about the provider, you can change it. And normally there should be uh, very little um, side effects. So my point is more about developers. So I hope you are all developers. If you are not developers, you can tell your uh, developer colleagues how to use open telemetry. So now comes you want to help your uh, ops colleague to have traces. There are basically two choices, and the choices depend on the stack that you are using. If you are using an, a runtime, the GVM, for example, then it's quite easy. You have auto instrumentation. And auto instrumentation means that your developers, they don't know to know nothing about open telemetry. They don't need to add any additional dependency about open telemetry. Just at runtime, there will be a flag or whatever, and the code will be auto instrumented. Hence the name auto instrumentation. If you don't have a runtime, so if you are using Rust, for example, or Go, which has the runtime but very small, then you have no choice. You need your developers to add an additional or multiple additional dependencies and actually instrument their code manually. It can also be the case that you have a runtime, but you want more precise details or you want to tweak how open telemetry works and the auto instrumentation is not good enough, then same result. So this, uh, I believe, is how you should do if you have a runtime, start slow, start low, use auto instrumentation. It actually will cost you nearly nothing, if not nothing, and you can already get some benefits. It can also be very beneficial in situations where you need to have the buy-in of the management to get budget. You don't have any money. And manual instrumentation costs money. It will raise the cost of your development. So with auto-instrumentation, you don't care about that. You get the results, then you show them to your manager and, and you can ask them, hey, perhaps we can get budget to have more precise or we want to solve this specific problem. So I've talked a lot uh, and I want to show what I told you through a demo. I've recently, and you are the first one to see my improved demo because before it was much, much simpler. So I have added several components. So this is an e-commerce demo, right? Uh, yeah, a mock one, but still. Um, I have uh, uh, the home page, so I want to get a list of all products with uh, their stock and their price. So first, uh, I ask for the products. At the front, I have an API getaway that will protect me from er everything. I, it will rate limit, it will authenticate, it will do whatever I want. It will forward the stuff to the products endpoint Product endpoint is the GVM application with Spring Boot and Kotlin. Then I will ask for stocks. Stocks is a Rust Axum um, application, and it delegates actually to several warehouses. Oh, it's it's too. Nah. Uh, here the 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 EU warehouse is also a Spring Boot Kotlin uh, app, but I've used GraalVM native to make it a native uh, app. Uh, Sorry, first I have an internal API getaway because it doesn't mean that you can have one single getaway, you can have multiple ones. Uh, then the warehouse in the US is uh, Go and uh, Gin Tonic. Well, I'm not a Go developer, but I found the, no the name funny, so I use this one. Uh, and for, uh, uh, for the, the Japan one, I use Ruby. For the pricing, I'm using Python and Flask. Um, I will be caching the result in Redis, and we can see that uh, 
All the data, by the way, of all components are stored uh, in Postgres as well. We'll see that we also get some interesting trace. And because I had very, very um, numerous questions about how, oh, but it doesn't work with asynchronous, I have uh, an express demo about how you can still use uh, the trace context specification in asynchronous context. So here I have a MQTT queue and I have a TypeScript uh, Node.js application. Does that work for you? That's a lot, right? And the good thing is, depending on who is interested in what, I will uh, ask you to raise your hand and I can uh, have a drill down into some component. But please don't ask me too much about stuff I don't know about because, uh, for example, this is my first uh, Node.js application in my life, so probably it's very bad. Um, the most important uh, component is, the, is the, the entry point because it's the one that generates the trace ID and the first span ID. In that case, I'm using Apache API 6. Who knows about Apache API 6? Thanks. <laughs> oh, second. Good. For the rest, I'm in the right room. I work on Apache API 6. Um, so it's uh, an API gateway. It's built on Nginx, very solid, very mature. Uh, reverse proxy. The issue is that Nginx open source, when you need to change the configuration for it to reload, you need to switch it off and on again, which is not super great for um, something that sits at the entry point of your information system. So to cope with that, there is a project called OpenResty, which is a Lua JIT that allows you to change the configuration and hot reload it. The problem is that the configuration of OpenResty and Nginx are very, very similar, which at scale doesn't work well with maintenance. So um, Apache API 6 allows you to create some abstractions such as routes, service, and everything is plugin based. As I mentioned, the most important part is this one. Why? Because uh, not here, but here, you have the sampler. In general, you don't want to trace every single transaction. You want to have a sampling. And at the beginning, you might say, OK, I will sample perhaps, let's say, 10%. And you will decrease it with time because you have more and more confidence. And then you deploy a new component and you want to increase it again. So the sampling is very important here. Since it's a demo, I have the sample always on. But you should always remember to sample your traces. So here is my. Uh, I, I'm using Docker Compose. I hope that I built everything. Yes, I just rebuilt now. So if something doesn't work, eh, I'm guilty. Uh, I'm using Jaeger uh, for the um, open, tr uh, open telemetry collector, uh, be not because it's the best of the best. It's just that I can use a simple image with one single environment variable, and it works. And I'm very happy about it. Uh, here is my API 6 front the catalog that I mentioned, the pricing, which is uh, Python, the inventory that is Rust. Here I configure all of my warehouses. So it's just a proxy of sorts, but it aggregates everything. The internal um, API 6 instance, the warehouse with um, in Go, the warehouse in GraalVM, the warehouse in Ruby, the analytics, that I don't want to show you now. So first, I should get back here. I will start with auto instrumentation. Uh, as I mentioned, I have a Postgres instance where I store all the data in different schemas, but I didn't want to have multiple Postgres instance. And one Redis. That's a lot. And I will Docker Compose up and hope that everything works as expected. Docker Compose, I will down everything just to be sure. And I will Docker up and pray. So far, it seems that it's not that bad. Yeah, I will friend Java, which is the latest. And then I can curl. And I will curl for a single product. And you don't care that much about the results. The results that is interesting to us is here. So 
I ask for, I ask Jaeger. This is the uh, Jaeger way. It's not that in important. But here you can see already all the components that were detected. And when I check it, you can see one single business request across all components. As I mentioned, you start with um, the um, API Gateway. And you can attach additional data. For example, here, I will just uh, add an additional header that I have configured, which I don't remember the name of, so I need to check. And it's config, it's API 6, it's front, and it should be this one. Uh, not, it's not this one, it's the other one. And it's called hotel key. So here I can pass an additional header and say uh, hello Berlin buzzwords I can get back I can find the other trace I have the new one and you see there are different number of spans uh, because there is catching now involved I can get back to it later if you're interested and if I check here now I have Hello, Berlin buzzwords. That's the reason why some people say that uh, traces might replace logging. I, I, I'm not uh, saying it will be the case, but some people say hey, it might replace logging because you can also have this additional data. As I mentioned, the sampler is always on. You can see that what I mentioned in my diagram is actually happening. So the API 6 um, calls the catalog. You can see like those two internal spans inside the component. So you have at least one span in the component, but you can have internal span in the component. The catalog itself is calling the inventory. The inventory is uh, calling the API 6 internal instance that calls for the stocks Europe. It's calling for uh, the um, stocks and it's calling for the stocks in Japan as well. And, and this is it. Something also interesting is you can compare. Here I'm using Jaeger UI. You can compare two different uh, routes and see what was the difference. And here the difference is that in some case, I was calling directly the database. And the other case, I, I'm using Redis for cache. So that's something that can also be useful. Uh, if you are interested, if you are an architect, uh, OpenTelemetry also allows you to do some interesting stuff. Like here, I'm, I'm, I'm calling all the products. So I've got lots and lots of more uh, data, more traces. And we can also see that for each product, actually, that, that I, I get from the database in the catalog, I'm calling the inventory in the pricing. So that's pretty stupid. I should ask in one go, give me the price for all those products and give me the inventory for all those products. So if you are an architect, you can also check the validity of your architecture. Or perhaps even if you are a, a, a developer, that might be interesting to you. I'm, I'm losing lots and lots of resource here. And that you didn't see it from my diagram, because I had no clue how it worked. Um, what can also be interesting to you? Um, here, the catalog is calling. Yeah, uh, I'm using Kotlin. Who loves Kotlin? Yeah. Who, uh, not so much. Not yet. not yet. You are a future Kotlin lover. Um, I love Kotlin, but I suck at parallel programming. And in Kotlin, you might know there is this thing called coroutine that allows you to easily uh, do parallel calls. Yeah, right, and easily. And it looks super nice, but you don't know whether it worked or not. And um, here, it worked, because I'm using coroutines, and I see that I'm, I'm, I'm calling um, sorry, where was it? The inventory and the pricing. Where the pricing? No, it's not this one. It's this one. Yeah, the pricing is here and the inventory is here. So at some point, you should see that there should be some parallel calls here and here. 
They, they shouldn't be like serialized, they should be in parallel. So, I saw there were lots of people interested in ja Java, right? So I should dive a bit into the Java stuff. A bit, not too much. As I promised, here I'm using auto-instrumentation. So this is my POM. I'm not using Gradle because I hate Gradle. Um, it's just like friendly bashing, yeah? nothing personal. Um, and you see there is nothing that is related uh, to open telemetry, nothing. Nothing at all. So how does it work? Well, here it's not at runtime. It's at build time because I'm using Docker. Um, this is a multi-stage Docker file. The, uh, are you familiar with multi-stage Docker file? Yeah. Uh, so basically, the first I compile, the second I run. And when I'm building the image, I'm getting the latest open telemetry agent. And when I run it, so this is the run phase, I, I add it to the command line. In this case, nobody, none of my developers are aware that actually they will be using open telemetry. And of course, I've got the default traces. And the default traces are few and far between. Like here, I have one because it's, uh, it's a bit small. Uh, but believe me, I'm using the uh, Spring uh, Data GPA uh, repository. I think so. <laughs> At least I remember. So uh, because I'm using, no, it's the reactive one. It's not Spring Data GPA, it's uh, Spring Reactive, Spring Data Reactive. Uh, this one is created for me by Spring, so it, it's proxied, and so it creates a trace. Here, I have the Postgres. I'm instrumenting the Postgres driver. So it knows exactly what stuff I'm doing. I'm doing a select product star from product where product ID equals blah, 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 limits, whatever. I didn't write a single line, and I already have the query, which is not bad. Uh, Python developers? OK, I'm not that good, but I can show you the same. I didn't ask my Python developer to do anything as well. Uh, I have my uh, like poetry stuff here. Nothing open telemetry specific. But during the build, I'm doing this. So here I'm doing here docs, so I can write everything in one go. Um, I install the dependencies that I already have. I install open telemetry, and then it gives me a new command that will actually will check through all the existing dependencies, check if there is an open telemetry component that relates to it and install it as well. And so on the Python port, uh, which is the pricing which I don't have here, so I should get back here. Where is the pricing? Get me the pricing. Hey, it's here. Uh, not here, here. I have, eh. no, doesn't work like this. Sorry, the, the screen is a bit shortened at the end. But basically, I'm using Flask, so it, it, it's able to check for Flask, and it's able to check for the connection to the DB. So I'm not using any uh, pool like in Java, where you first create your, your pools, and then you can reuse the connections. And that's good. So we can do a bit more tweaking. What we can do is we can actually now do some manual instrumentation. Any Rust developers? Go developers? No JS developers? You don't make my life easier. So I will, I will stick with Python uh, and with Java. But uh, in any case, if you are interested, everything is on GitHub. Um, now I can add manual instrumentation. Because as I mentioned, you can start with auto instrumentation. But you can uh, level up to um, uh, manual instrumentation even on the GVM. Of course, in that case, it means that you actually need uh, to add your open telemetry stuff. 
So first, I, I just start with annotations. Uh, um, but of course, you can use the, the full-fledged API that will be in my third step uh, in the terminal as well. Now I, I add open telemetry. Uh, on the Java side, well, sorry, Kotlin side, uh, I don't remember where is the code. Here I can add additional additional annotations, uh, which are open telemetry annotation. So here it means that eh, perhaps it's a bit small. Uh, it means there a trace will be uh, created here when uh, the code uh, goes through here. But you can also sorry. Um, you can also override the default name. So the default name will be the unqualified class name plus the method name. So here I'm just saying, OK, I will replace fetch product details with fetch. As with Apache API 6, you can also add additional tags in your trace. So here, for example, I'm interested in the product ID because I don't know, there was a bug in production that I didn't get the correct price of the product. So I want to check that the product ID that I'm saying is, is the right one. OK? That's not that great because I actually, here I'm passing the product. So it contains the product ID. But because I'm using annotation, I cannot get easily the product ID from inside the product. So I need to pass this ID uh, directly. And uh, though it's useless, I, I'm, I'm still doing that. And now, normally, if we like curl, I will just ask for the second product. And if we get back here, if we refresh, uh, here on the catalog, when it fetches, here I have the product ID. And uh, you can see that I have a, like more, I have additional, um, traces in the catalog that I didn't get before. I have this one, the product, and I have this one, and I have this one. Uh, on the Python side, I actually add to use the uh, full-fledged API. So here, I'm not tied to a method uh, or function. I'm actually creating the trace directly inside of the code. I'm using the and yeah, the trace is this name, and I also can check the attribute, so the product ID. So we can see that I've asked for product ID uh, two in the pricing. Uh, not not this one. This one that was created may, like automatically here. You have product ID two. So I can check that they both match, and I am not asking for the price of another product. And uh, finally, asynchronous. So the problem is that we, did, we actually didn't have to care about anything. All the libraries are doing the work for us. What they are doing is they are using the spec that I have described. They are getting the HTTP header from OpenTelemetry. They are recreating the trace ID, the span ID, and they are actually sending the data to uh, the open telemetry collector at the end. So the problem with asynchronous is that we, we don't have this HTTP header anymore. So how can we do that? We need to do it manually. So what I'm doing, and I don't know where well, it will be a bit uh, fast. But what I'm doing now uh, on my GVM, I'm using the full power of the, uh, where is it? No, 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 no. The OpenTelemetry API. I'm actually extracting the trace ID, the span ID, well, in, in one stuff. And I'm writing that, you remember the diagram at the beginning? Well, not at the beginning, but uh, not here. I'm here. So the catalog will be extracting the header. 
and putting it as metadata along with the message. Depends on your MQTT version. If your MQTT version is good enough, then you can like write it as metadata. If it's too low, then you need to write it along with the message. So the JSON payload will be bigger. And then on the other side, I will get the data, and I will interpret the header and create a new span. Let's see if it works. And here you can see it's, yeah, that's why you should never sit at the, like, back of the room. But here you can see the analytics, these additional components. I can show you the code on the Java side. Uh, where is it? Price service. Uh, I don't see it anymore. Analytics. So I have created a filter. So it will actually work on every request. And I'm doing what I told you I would do. So every time I'm getting the context from the current request, and that is extracted automatically for me by the framework. And I create the message holder. And in the message holder, I will actually use this trace parent stuff as metadata. The trace parent is actually the name of the header, the HTTP header described by uh, the um, uh, trace context specification. And then I write it. And on the Node.js side, uh, where is it? Uh, warehouse uh, analytics. It's here. Source index.ts. I'm doing exactly the opposite. So I'm getting it out of the metadata. I get it from the context through the user property. And now I create a tracer and I create the span. And here, you could actually do something between the tracer start span and the end. But here, it's the end. I don't need to do anything. And that, my friend, is how to, I get everything. And now that I have got one minute left, what we can do, uh, I can try, well, I can try. I can, like, Docker stop analytics. No, Docker compose. Stop analytics. Now, if I do the request again, you don't see the analytics component anymore. But you can still see the trace without the analytics. Now, if I start it again, what will happen? The component will start, will read the queue, and will send the span to open telemetry. And now it will complete everything. So now it has 20. It should have 21 now. Yes, 21. And of course, since it's a synchronous, <laughs> the synchronous portion is on the left. And you can still see, still see the message on the right. And 40, everything is fine, just in time. Just the last slide. That might be interesting to you. Of course, for my ego, you can follow me on any of the social network. It's good for me. It's good for my reputation. It's good for my boss also. Uh, if you are interested about the GitHub repo, everything is on GitHub. Uh, be careful. I regularly rebase to get the latest and greatest dependency versions. So if you fork it, be aware that it will be very hard to merge again. And if I got you interested in Apache API 6, even though the talk was not about it, please have a look. It's a very good Apache API gateway. And now I know uh, there is no more time. So if you want to go to it, you are welcome. If you want to ask me questions, you are also welcome.